I'm going to now ask our uh, project team um, to help us answer some of the questions that we have been receiving in the chat while these presentations were playing. Uh, we'll get through as many presentations as we can. Um, and um, if you'd like to pose an, a question that you haven't already um, put in the chat, please continue to do so as we move through these. If there are any questions that we don't get to, we will be answering everything in a comprehensive summary of this meeting that will be available at the link that you can see up on screen here. Um, you can also submit questions through the online survey that is also associated with that public meeting page, which will be open until December 18th. So if you'd like to spend some more time with the material and ask some follow up questions, please, by all means, feel free to do so. So. We're going to attempt to pull our project team onto screen now. Um, I would like to introduce um, Herb Sweeney with MBBA, uh, Shannon Baker, our Director for Parks and Public Realm at Waterfront Toronto, Natami Stewart, a Senior Project Manager for Parks at Waterfront Toronto, Jonathan Ho with Intuitive, Don McKinnon with Dylan, Leah Mahoney with West 8, Simon Cram, a Project Director at Waterfront Toronto, Sonia Vangeli, a planning and design project matter manager at Waterfront Toronto. And we also have some um, staff from the City of Toronto joining us, uh, Christian Giles um, and David Stonehouse with the City of Toronto's Waterfront Secretariat, and Trevor Greenman with the City of Toronto's Transporta Transportation Planning Department. There's also even more members of the project team here on the meeting um, who we may call on depending on what questions come in. And before we move into answering your questions, I'd just like to acknowledge that um, uh, Councillor Paula Fletcher, City Councillor for Toronto Danforth, um, has joined us and is on the meeting. And because we can't see each other, um, it's to me to acknowledge um, and uh, show our appreciation for continued en engagement, deep, deep engagement with this project. Um, and it's been a long haul in this project. Um, so we do appreciate it and we appreciate um, her joining us here today for this uh, critical project milestone, this, this meeting with some really critical updates. Um, so. We received one question in advance because the materials were posted um, in advance of this meeting. Um, and I'm going to start by reading that question before we move into the Q's and A's that we've received in the chat just now. That question that we received in advance was, could the new park and all other projects use the signature Waterfront Toronto light instead of the utilitarian ones? This would create a sense of place and would continue the existing waterfront's identity. I am referring to the Olivio light standards found on Queen's Key and other Waterfront Toronto projects. Um, and I'm going to ask Shannon if she could uh, to come up and answer that question. Thanks, Mira. So the, um, the Olivio light was selected for the central waterfront and uh, through the work that we've been doing on the PLFP project, we've uh, the design consultants have done a comprehensive review of the site con conditions as well as the, uh, the lighting requirements for the three parks within our project scope. And uh, they've settled on the Ure, which is a different type of light from the same manufacturer. So this, um, this light responds to the unique conditions of the parks, uh, which are quite large and uh, run for a long length uh, adjacent to the lake and the ship channel uh, and the, the new river. And um, uh, so, so uh, the idea is that these lights would be unique to the PLFP parks and um, part of the identity of, of those spaces rather than as part of the identity of the central waterfront. Thanks, Shannon, uh, for answering that question. So I'm now going to move into taking some of the questions that came in during the presentations. Um, so, the first question that came in during the presentation was, um, has Waterfront or others involved made provisions in construction contracts to stop all construction temporarily in the case of major financial crisis? For example, due to the tremendous debt the country, province and city of Toronto are facing because of the pandemic. Um, so uh, I think I'll answer that one um, uh, in lieu of asking a member of our project team to answer it. Uh, the first thing I'll say is I can appreciate that there is a lot of anxiety. And as I mentioned, when we first um, opened up the meeting, 
how much we appreciate everyone continuing to engage in this project with us. We know that this is um, a time of great anxiety and there's a lot of concern around um, how budgets are being spent. Um, this project has uh, many, many long-term benefits, both in terms of uh, providing some critical open spaces and green spaces that we've seen during this time um, are so needed and important for uh, for people and uh, also long-term economic benefits, of course, for all of our government partners. Um, to answer your, your specific question, um, yes, our contracts would allow for us to stop, although there's been no suggestion from our stakeholders that this is a consideration. So I hope that answers uh, your question there. Um, and I should say that um, it's a little bit uh, cumbersome to try and answer follow-ups because of the way the chat works. Um, and so if you did have a follow-up or if you don't feel your question was answered to your satisfaction, you can put it in the chat. If we have time, we'll try and come back. Um, and as I said, we'll also be able to respond more in depth in the summary from this meeting. So moving to the next question that was asked, um, has Waterfront Toronto's position regarding the Gardner realignment project changed given the unprecedented budget issues facing the city, province, et cetera, especially given the section to be re rebuilt has yet to move ahead and the limited time to halt it. Um, so what I'll say to that is that Waterfront Toronto is proceeding consistent with the approved environmental assessment. I don't know, David or Christian, if you'd like to speak to that question further um, uh, on the city's behalf. We have them here. Um, we'll, we'll move on for now. Um, so there was a reference. The next question is: There was a reference to thermoplastic in the road crossings. What does this refer to? Um, and I'm wondering if Liam from West State would be able to field this one. Hello. Yes. Um, so thermoplastic is a pretty common material used for crossings. It's that as it's kind of an enhanced paint, and it's a pretty durable flexible material that here adheres to a lot of different things, but it's that kind of classic crosswalk that you see, uh, that white paint. So kind of has a bit of a, a pillow effect to it. It's very thin, but it uh, also has some layering to it. So uh, there's some ability to reflect a little bit uh, the lighting. Um, so it's just a common standard durable material that's pretty economic as well that we typically use. Great, thank you. Who knew? Um, moving back to my list here to make sure that we're going in order. So the next question is, have we considered grade separation slash pedestrian tunnel slash bridge in each road crossing, for example, Morse Logan, to protect cyclists and pedestrian safety? Um, so perhaps I can ask Jonathan to answer that question from Intuitive. Hi, thank you, Mira. So uh, um, grade separations, pedestrian tunnels, or bridges have not been considered for the road crossings for the streets without controlled intersections. Instead, we've made improvements to the pavement markings, vehicle stop bar locations, and sidewalk and bike path layouts. Um, uh, the improvements in design are intended to improve the safety of the crossings, and then um, additional safety review is also underway to identify further improvements to the design for all the users of the roadway and uh, the public realm as well. Thanks, Jonathan, for jumping in on that one. Um, just scrolling down my list here, the next question is about the Harbor Lead rail line, which uh, we showed in uh, the uh, Lakeshore Boulevard East part of the presentation is being relocated to the center of Lakeshore Boulevard um, for, for some section of it. The question is, at what point will the Harbor Lead rail line um, connect to the main rail line? Um, and Jonathan, again, I'm going to call on you to answer that one. Okay. So the Harbor Lead rail line currently connects to the main corridor or the main rail line west of the Don River, um, uh, past the Don, west of the Don River and up the hill. Um, and that connection has not changed or will not be changed. So the connection to the main quarter will still be at that location. Great, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, the next question um, is uh, about uh, the presentation that was made um, by, from West State um, regarding the plans for public realm along Lakeshore East. The question is, why are there planned to be trees planted in the spaces where future streets will go? It feels like kind of a waste 
when the trees could instead be planted in places where they aren't destined for early removal. Um, so Liam, um, perhaps you could address that question. Yes, yeah, so um, what we're doing with the street tree uh, planting strategy is um, in those areas where you do see road crossings that are pretty much confirmed, such as the broad view, it's going to be a major intersection with a pretty large right of way. We're using more um, understory trees or even shrubs rather than um, uh, planting in uh, kind of a, you know, more of the robust uh, canopy trees that may take a while to mature and uh, grow into their full potential. <clears throat> However, on some of the future roads that are a bit still predetermined, such as between uh, in that kind of second slice of the Lakeshore Boulevard, <clears throat> we um, we are planning to kind of plant uh, quick growing trees like a very uh, fast growing. You do get kind of a break even point uh, with street trees where you start to gain off their benefit uh, ever a four year. So if you it's better to plant them at a four year and kind of, you know, if they'll be there for four years, you'll start to get the benefits of stormwater management, the respiratory um, and just the general kind of benefit and delight of having that and rather than a small scrubby tree um, or a, you know, a shrubbier tree. Um, so uh, the kind of the idea with that is just to uh, enhance the um, right away as much as possible while there's, you know, still some questions to be determined how this future developments break out. So, um, but a good takeaway is that four year kind of turnaround point is really where you start to see some benefit from planting street trees. So. The next question is, um, have you considered locations for public washrooms? Um, and I should note that there's been quite a bit of uh, back and forth uh, conversation in the chat about that question and a follow up question to that. So I'll ask it at the same time out of order, which is um, uh, the, how would the city uh, accommodate so many visitors to these public spaces um, without providing adequate facilities? Um, so I will ask Herb to answer the question of um, whether we've considered the location for public washrooms. Sure, thank you, Mira. So I think uh, to answer the question um, first, yes, there are pu some public washrooms that are planned um, with the delivery of the PLFP project in 2024. Um, those will be located within the Heritage Building uh, that's being relocated uh, from the edge of Commissioner Street within the park, and that's the Fire Hall 30 building. Um, within that building, there's uh, there'll be six unisex washrooms um, so single uh, user washrooms uh, that will service day-to-day uh, -day use of the park. Additionally, um, because there, there's quite an amount of programming that's been described for the park, um, there's been discussions with, uh, with the city, with PFNR, regarding when there are events that there's the capability to bring in supplemental washrooms. Great, thanks for, for addressing that. Um, and we know there's a, a broader conversation um, likely to be had just generally about access to public washrooms. We know that um, this, this is a concern that um, we often hear from people about. Um, so the next question is, um, is Promontory Park still on track for 2024 opening? Yes, um, and just as a clarification to that, yes, um, this map is showing the project scope. So what all is included in Portland's flood protection and what um, things will look like in 2024, give or take. Um, and you can see that Promontory Park South there to the west of Cherry Street um, uh, is going to be completed and open for 2024. And then Promontory Park North, which is that area where we've completed the Cherry Street Lake filling and built two new um, fish coves and uh, um, access to the shoreline there will be completed in the future. So that was never included as part of um, the scope of this project. The design has been done, so MVVA has taken that um, um, to, to completion on the design side um, so that we can make sure that in the future, as these um, future parks come along in lockstep with uh, development on Villiers Island, um, we will have a cohesive design for this one big park. Um, so you can see that park along River North and River South, as well as the green space in the spillway along Don Roadway, um, that's all going to be there in 2024. So,
So moving to the next question. Um, it's a comment with a question mark, so I'm going to read it. It says traffic barrier height should consider cyclists don't get blinded by oncoming car headlights. Um, so I don't know if there's anyone um, in transportation planning at the city who would like to comment on this. We'll certainly note this and take it back um, for the team to look into. I'm not sure um, anyone on the team can speak any further to that right now, but if you can raise your hand, I don't always know who all to identify. Liam? Yes, um, we are in some of the tighter uh, constraints. We are looking at a, a barrier design off. I mean, and maybe Johnson can also speak to this off the bridge, but also in that tighter right of way where the uh, it's more of a kind of a classic streetscape. Um, we're looking at a barrier design that's pretty module uh, modular, uh, like a Jersey barrier, and those usually typically are like point about 800 millimeters high uh, and with a, an additional railing height for uh, safety, uh, bicycle safety uh, to avoid kind of any like falling off the bike. Um, but um, that usually kind of covers the, the car headlight um, height, uh, at least the direct glare that you would get from a car uh, headlight, um, which is those are about half a meter high off the ground. Typically, you know, there's always outliers, but um, for the most part, I think we to do a good job of addressing some of that. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Liam, for that answer. Um, the next question is a long one. Um, and I'm going to read it out. It's about some of the logistics or behind uh, the new bridges that are coming um, to connect Villiers Island um, to downtown Toronto to the north and to the rest of the Portlands to the east. So the question is, regarding the Villiers Island bridges, how is installation going to work for the two additional bridges being delivered in Phase two, Cherry South Bridge and Commissioner's Bridge. The four bridges are being floated into place on barges, but the later two will be blocked from floating in by Cherry South Bridge. Also, what will be done with the future alignments for these bridges? Um, the renderings show a kind of grayed out area, but it's a bit vague. So I think I will ask Simon, who is one of our project directors and is working among other things on these bridges. OK, so um, all bridges will be transported to site via barges. Um, now, not all of them will be installed um, uh, the same way uh, that, the, that you've seen the first one being installed. Uh, so uh, those bridges uh, that are situated further inland um, will be conveyed to, to the land through something called jump bridges, uh, and then they'll be trans transported to position uh, using um, uh, SPMTs, uh, self-propelled mod modular transporters. So just a different technique, but uh, will ensure the bridges get seated where they need to as well. Uh, on the second part, the grade um, uh, area uh, conversation, I think we just need to make sure uh, what's the intent of the question before we just respond to it. I agree. Um, it's a, a, a little bit unclear. Um, if possible, um, if you are responsible for this question and you would like to clarify that second part of the question in the chat, please go ahead. Um, you can also email us or use the survey form after the meeting to um, follow up on that question and we'd be happy to provide you with um, some additional info um, about uh, how this is all going to work. In fact, our, our team would love to, they love to, to to talk about uh, the details of how all this complex work is actually coming together. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, are Have there been any extra measures to account for the increased volume of dogs to the area and, for example, how their waste will impact user areas and surrounding soil or water? Um, Herb, did you want to speak to that? Yes, yes, I can. So um, there are two dog off leash areas that are planned um, with the PLFP project. Those are within River Valley Park North at both both the west end where the intersection of future Cherry Street and Commissioner Street, as well as the east end of uh, the Commissioner Street uh, uh, intersection with the Commissioner Street Bridge. Um, and the 10 is that those are picking up uh, the two locations where users are crossing into the park system. Um, and I think the second part of the, the question there is that um, there are physical barriers that will uh, limit access uh, to the naturalized habitat for 
both dogs um, and users and, and people themselves. Uh, so we do have a whole series of different type of fence types um, that will make sure that we ensure the, um, the quality of the habitat. Next question is, are there any plans for sound barriers along Lakeshore Boulevard to reduce noise of traffic? Um, either maybe Don or Jonathan. Sure, it's gone here. I can I can answer that. So um, noise noise was assessed as part of the Gardner EA that did examine um, changes along Lakeshore Boulevard and um, recommendations for there were no recommendations for noise barriers. Um, along Lakeshore Boulevard. Okay, thanks. Um, and the second question, Don, I believe is going to be for you as well. The question is, what impact assessment has been done on traffic volumes on residential streets north of Lakeshore Boulevard and Eastern? And the follow-up, is there any planned future use for the central rail line down the middle of Lakeshore Boulevard? So um, regarding the first question, there's been um, a number of traffic um, assessments and traffic modeling studies completed over the years for this area. Um, the, the area that's covered the, the largest area most comprehensively is the south of Eastern and Portland's transportation master plan that uh, examined um, or, or forecasted change, changes in traffic and transportation throughout the area as a result of planned development in the area. And then building on uh, the work in, in the TMSP, there's been a, additional project-specific traffic um, studies and traffic modeling, including for the Gardner EA, um, that was specifically focused on changes to the Gardner and Lakeshore Corridor. And then um, that work, our additional traffic work is continuing, for example, with the Broadview A, which is um, con conducting um, additional modeling that's building on uh, the work that was done as part of the master plan. So uh, all of these studies have been looking at uh, changes in development, changes in traffic demand and uh, patterns in the area as a result of development and changes to the road network. And um, so all of these studies would be sources of information about uh, potential impact on existing streets. And then regarding the second question um, pertaining to the Harbor Lead and use of it. Um, it's my understanding that there's no, at this time, plans for um, sort of expansion or additional use of the line. It continues to be a, a low use line. So. Thank you, Don, for that detailed answer. And I know that's a lot of information. So uh, again, with answers like that, these will all be um, written out in the meeting summary. Um, and if uh, there are any follow-up questions about any of those studies or that work, our team is more than happy to provide those answers uh, to you after the fact. Um, this is only the first step in talking about uh, the work that's being done on Lakeshore Boulevard East, so there'll be more opportunities for these conversations to happen. Um, just scrolling through the questions again to make sure I'm in order. Um, so the next question that came in was what provisions are being made for the acknowledgement of the industrial heritage of the site, apart from the reuse of the marine terminal girders and the Atlas crane? So her, perhaps you can field that one. Yes. Um, so I think uh, an additional feature is that as part of the consultation project process with heritage preservation services, um, the commemoration strategy for the MT35 building um, will include uh, vertical elements, uh, light columns that reflect the, the scale of the west facade of MT35 and its relationship with the, the waterfront. Um, additionally, the existing foundation of the MT35 building is being retained and there'll be commemorative signage uh, to reflect uh, that uh, the history and the significance of that building um, and its um, reference to the maritime history of the Portlands. I think also additionally, um, there is an interpretive signage uh, program that is site-wide that will be looking at um, other features uh, ranging from the industrial heritage to the habitat creation um, and indigenous content 
um, that will be another layer that will uh, also talk about heritage uh, on the project. Herb, and um, looking at the next question, um, I think you may as well um, keep your, your camera on uh, and your mic on. What happened to the idea of canoe and kayak storage is the question. Yes, yeah, so the, the design of the parks does uh, provide access to uh, the water's edge at a number of locations for access, uh, both canoe kayaking to the general public. Um, there have been considerations that uh, were made for future proofing the project to allow for um, uh, potential canoe and kayak storage, but that component is not going to be delivered as a uh, base scope for the PLFP project. Thanks, Herb. Bear with me. So the next question, actually, looking at it, is for you, Herb. Um, the question is, will the planting be mature on day one? So by day one, this person is referring to um, when the parks are complete in 2024, uh, just as was done for Corktown Common. And Corktown Common, in case anyone um, isn't aware, is um, the park in the West Onlands that was built as phase one of uh, Waterfront Toronto's uh, plan for flood protection. The park is built on top of a flood protection landform, and uh, we also worked with MPDA on that project. So Herb, um, you'll be able to answer that. Yes, yeah, so th that's a really good question, and it's a bit of a complicated one. Um, because the, the project area is so large and we have about 27 acres of park um, there, and the duration of construction is a very long period of time, there will be areas within the parks and within the floodplain of the river um, that will have a, a significant amount of time to become established as planting is beginning in some of those areas as early as next year, 2021. Um, however, due to construction sequencing, uh, there are also areas that will not be planted until the end of 2023. So um, there'll be varying areas of establishment uh, throughout the park system on day one when the project opens in 2024. Thanks, Herb. Um, the next question is going back to the public realm design for Lakeshore Boulevard East. Um, and the question is, um, will you be providing the species list for each of the different planting zones, specifically for Lakeshore Boulevard and public realm? Oh, it's actually a combo question. And the Promontory Park South and River Valley. So um, I will actually ask um, if I could, Tyler, Brat from Planning Partnership and also Herb to kind of combine their answers. Tyler first for Lakeshore and then Herb, you can speak to um, the uh, Promontory Park and River Park. Sorry. Um, there I he is. To Lakeshore Boulevard. Um, <clears throat> for, for that space, we've prioritized um, the most resilient species we can. Uh, our primary driver for species selection along here was plant survival, um, followed by diversity of our plant palette for long-term resilience, um, followed by canopy coverage, and then promoting native species. Um, at the tree and large shrub level, um, we are relying exclusively on native species um, and looking at uh, cult varieties of native species at the perennial level. Um, but uh, because of the design of the roadway, um, there are a number of places where um, we've got a, a fair amount of room between the road and our planting. And so, so while we have the most resilient species along the um, street edge, we have been able to incorporate uh, some species that you wouldn't typically find in a streetscape as we move further away from that, that edge. So, well, I don't have the entire um, species list at hand. Um, we do have 24 tree and shrub species and uh, 30 or 40 um, perennial and grass species uh, included in this planting plan.
Thanks. And Herb, if you want to field the, the same question, but for um, the parks. Sure. Um, so within the park areas, uh, there, there's a pretty diverse um, list of plant species uh, based on the, the varying conditions, uh, the microclimates, the hydrology, uh, whether the plantings are down within the floodplain um, or up within the parks and on the edges of the public realm. Um, so it's uh, it's a pretty long, extensive plant list, and I'm going to say several hundred species that we're looking at uh, across the entire park area. Um, I think that that is something that certainly uh, we are looking to um, tell the story on. So making that information available to the public is uh, very much of our interest on the project. Thanks. Um, and if there are any follow up questions, um, for, for either Herbert or Tyler about specifics on the species. We do have a lot of that content also um, on the project website. And if it's not there, we can certainly um, provide it to those who are interested in learning more. Sorry about that, scrolling again. So the next question I think I will field. Um, the question is, heard a rumor about a pedestrian bridge from Villiers Island to Toronto Islands. Any truth in that? Um, what I can say on behalf of Waterfront Toronto is that um, no one has spoken to us about it, um, and that's not something that's currently contemplated in any of our plans. Um, so I can't I, I can't say anything more than that um, because um, that's the extent of our knowledge on the topic. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. I know it doesn't really, but uh, not not to our knowledge. Next question um, is going back to the roadway design for Lakeshore Boulevard East. The question is at the Don Roadway intersections, all the cycle crossovers are bi directional, but on the west side, I would think this west one, uh, not actually clear on this question, I apologize. Um, this west one, be helpful to be bi-directional also. Jonathan, have you decoded this question by any chance um, and are able to answer it? Yeah, I think I think the, the question is all the cycle crossovers are bi-directional, but except for the one on the west side. And the question is, or it's noted that I would think this west one would be helpful to be bi-directional also. Oh, um, thanks. So the design team um, would like to note that the on roadway intersection is in a very constrained space with a number of limiting existing conditions, uh, such as the location of the edge of the Don River and the harbor lead line. But we are further reviewing and refining the intersection design in close coordination with the city to try to balance the accessibility of the street crossings with the safety of the pedestrians and cyclists, uh, in addition to maintaining the functionality of the intersection for vehicles, uh, and in particular, the turning movements of large trucks, which um, the movement of is significant on Lakeshore Boulevard. Um, so we this is something that uh, is under further discussion internally, and we are always trying to find a, a, a more refined and superior solution. So you can expect more information in the future. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you for um, saving me from um, my inability to read. <laughs> I appreciate I appreciate you. I appreciate all of the project team, but um, in this moment, I appreciate you the most. Um, so moving into the next question, again, we're going back to a question about plantings. Um, the question is, um, will only native tree, shrub, and plant species be used in all of the plantings. It was presented that the species will need to be resilient to wind and salt, but also support biodiversity and provide pollinator and color interest. Native plant species can satisfy all of these conditions. This will also be in line with Toronto's official biodiversity strategy. So this is, I believe, a question um, about the design on Lakeshore Boulevard East. So Liam or Tyler, if you would like to grab that one. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, yeah. um, so as I mentioned before, in terms of trees and shrubs, we're relying exclusively on native species. Um, but as we get to the perennial level, um, we've incorporated a couple of varieties of native species. So they provide um, largely the same 
um, pollinator and um, habitat benefits, um, especially because um, occasionally when you are using varieties, um, they're bred to not seed and spread, and that's not something that we want here. So um, we've ensured that we're only in including varieties that will self seed and spread on their own. Um, uh, so, so we've done this for a couple of reasons. One is because we, as I mentioned before, we need to focus on um, plant survivability and resiliency, and um, and also plant um, the color palette as well. Um, so we've been able to expand the color palette by using um, varieties uh, of these species as well. And one example would be like our, our common yarrow. If we use just the, the, the species, we would have a white flower um, with not a particularly long bloom time, but we can incorporate varieties to, to gain yellow and pink flowers as well um, with the same um, benefits uh, from a habitat and biodiversity standpoint. So um, while we're not exclusively, exclusively native species, um, we're close to that. Um, and, and I think we have pretty good reasons for expanding the palette just ever so slightly into, into a couple of varieties there. Okay. Uh, um a uh, very detailed and interesting answer. And I, I will layer on to what I said earlier about um, people seeking additional information. There are many different directions um, that you can dig into these projects and the design. Um, and in the past, we have presented some deep dives into some of these areas. Um, and I'm sure the team would be willing to provide a little bit of additional content into specific areas like that if there are people who are really interested. Um, so again, follow up in the survey link um, or via email with us. Um, and We'd be happy to, to provide some additional info there um, in some of those areas. Um, so um, before I go to the next question, I will just note that um, our chief planning and design officer, Chris Glacik, has jumped in and suggested that perhaps the question about the pedestrian bridge um, was in reference to a bridge from Villiers Island to the Parliament slip. If that's the case and I misunderstood, my apologies. I know it's it's difficult without the two way back and forth um, and follow ups on your questions. Um, but the answer, if you hadn't seen it in the chat, is that uh, that is being studied, but is not yet funded. Um, so just to provide that clarification and thanks, Chris, for jumping in there. Um, all right, so moving on to the next question in our um, queue. This is just a housekeeping question, but I'll just answer it here um, about whether the materials, the presentations will be available after this meeting. Absolutely, they will. And in fact, they're already available on the um, project page or the uh, meeting page on our project website. Um, the link is available um, in the meeting invite. Um, we'll also provide it in the chat before we sign off and uh, we'll certainly follow up um, with those, at least all those who registered for this meeting and provided contact information. We can definitely follow up with that link um, so that we make sure that you don't miss out on that information. Um, so moving to the next question. Um, have any so this is in some ways a follow up on the question that Herb uh, addressed about uh, dog waste. Um, it's have any sustainable improvements been considered for the impact of excessive garbage dog waste and impacts from wildlife? Um, so I'm not sure, um, uh, Herb, if you're able to expand on your on uh, your answer earlier or if there's any additional information that anyone um, would like to offer on that. It's a broad question for sure. Yeah, I, th I think Mirror, um, I, all I can really speak to that one on is that um, we have been working uh, with PFNR related to um, the operation maintenance strategies uh, for the park. And uh, as uh, PFNR changes or makes updates to their programs, uh, those would be implemented into the current park design. But beyond that, I don't have any other updates. Thanks. And if there's any additional information um, that any of our colleagues can provide, again, we'll, we can expand on that uh, answer in the meeting minutes. So moving into the next question, it's a question about the uh, Sakura trees, or um, also called cherry trees, on current Cherry Street in the Portlands. Um, the question is, are they meant to be protected in the long term, and are there any plans to add more Sakura trees to the area? Feels fitting is the comment there. So her, perhaps you can speak to that. Sure, and the, the the cherry trees that I believe in 
that are in reference are the ones that are located along Cherry Street and the uh, Keating Channel adjacent to the Cherry Street pub there. Um, and those are actually not within the limit of work uh, of the PLFP project. So we will not be impacting um, those with any of the, the flood protection uh, work that's being done on this project. Um, so we think they're beautiful as well and hope they do uh, survive. Thanks, Herb. So yeah, to confirm, there are no plans to remove um, those particular trees. Um, so moving into the next question in the queue, the question is, for the design and planning of intervention areas associated with floodplains and rivers, the return period of 100 years was used or other return periods can also be used. I'm not sure that's a question. Is the question about what return period was used for the design? If you could just comment in the chat and clarify if that's what you're asking, that would be wonderful. Not sure. Um, we'll, we'll give that that person a little bit of time to clarify um, what what exactly the question was. Um, and then that is the end of the questions that I see in the queue. Um, if I've missed you, my sincere apologies. Um, or if anyone else has some uh, follow up questions. Uh, please feel free to put them into the chat now and the team will be more than happy to answer them. Ken Dion, another member of our project team at Waterfront Toronto, has offered a clarification in the chat about um, the, the modeling that was done for um, this design, saying flood protection is based on the Hurricane Hazel sized flood event, which is much larger than the one in 100 year return period flood. So I don't know if that answers your question. Um, so. Seth had um, added a follow up regarding the phase two bridges and it hadn't been followed up on. Um, we will have to take that question away. I think Seth, the best thing to do would be for us to look at um, the map and provide some annotation because I think it's a little bit tricky online um, without the benefit of being in the room and actually walking you through. Um, but um, what I'm going to suggest is that the team goes back and looks at the map and um, marks it up a little bit for you. Um, if that's if that's OK with you and then we'll follow up after the meeting. Um, we have a comment here um, from Allison. You mentioned that a heritage fire hall will be moved and public washrooms located in the building. Where is the building currently? Um, so Herb, you can probably speak to that. And Michaela, if possible, to bring up the map. I don't know if that will be um, possible in in quick order or helpful, but she can try while Herb speaks to it. Yes, yeah, so if you're able to, to open up the map. So um, on this map, uh, you, you can see the label for Commissioner Street and just uh, below the T of Commissioner Street is an I symbol. Um, that is the location of where the Fire Hall 30 building, um, sorry, up closer to the T location at the edge of the street. Um, and that uh, building currently sits on the very edge of the sidewalk for existing Commissioner Street. Because Commissioner Street with this project is being widened to accept uh, the potential future light rail transit or BRT bus rapid transit lines, um, the building needed to be shifted outside of the current right of way um, and it's being moved south into the park um, with a similar relationship to the edge of the street. Thanks, Herb, and thanks, Michaela, for the quick swap with the map there. Um, and again, that's the kind of question that we can also add a visual um, in the meeting notes so that it's very clear um, where that is. Um, so we have another question um, here from Edward that says, in the areas designed and meant for commercialization and retail in the long term, is there forward thinking approaches being made to block or limit chain and formulaic retail? Creating a truly unique area will require not homogenizing it with yet another Starbucks, shoppers, a and W, et cetera. Um, so that, that is a question that um, is requiring a little bit of a deeper answer um, and not answerable in one minute. And um, also, Edward, probably not answerable by the folks that we have here today um, who are focused on a different um, task. Uh, not that it's not 
an extremely relevant um, and important conversation to be had. Um, I would hate to put the members of our project team who are tasked with designing um, the rivers and parks and roadway and public realm um, and not in the planning of Villiers Island or the other precincts in the Port Lines to answer that question. Um, but um, we, we can certainly take it back um, and look to have the appropriate project team members follow up with you on um, what the plans are for retail in the various precincts on the waterfront. Um, with that said, um, there may be time for one last question, if there is one. Um, and if not, we're right on 4.30, so we will let everyone sign off and get on with their afternoon. Seeing no one typing anything, um, I want to again thank our project team, um, thank our project partners, um, thank Councillor Fletcher for coming, um, and um, all of you who took the time out to come and ask these really thoughtful questions. We hope that we were able to provide um, answers to your satisfaction. Um, if we weren't, um, we will certainly want to uh, come back and provide some deeper answers to your questions. Um, I see actually a couple of hands up from members of our project team. Um, uh, Christian, is there something that you wanted to add? Uh, yes, I was, uh, I was just about to uh... There's the outstanding question related to the uh, the budget, um, and uh, unless uh, David Stonehouse is on, um, I can take a crack at it. I'm not, uh, you know, 100% uh, an expert in in how the city's capital project works, uh, budgeting process works. But uh, essentially, the the funds are planned out uh, a couple years in advance, and it's through the capital process. Um, and for the uh, the Portland's flood protection. Uh, project. Um, there was a tripartite agreement that was signed back in 2018 between the uh, federal government, the province and the city. And at that time, each of the three levels of government committed their one third funding for the project. So the monies are, are available through that for the as far as the PLFP goes. And then through the Gardner components, you have the Gardner EA and the capital budget process there um, in which the uh, the funds would be uh, made available. Um, through that process. Uh, it's a bit rambling, um, but uh, I hope at least it provides some sort of a, a partial answer. No, it's much appreciated. Thanks, and Christian, just to remind everyone, since the introductions were a while ago in the meeting, um, Christian Giles with the City of Toronto's Waterfront Secretariat. Um, that's who was just speaking. Um, I did notice um, that our Chief Project Officer, David Kistern, had a hand up and would like to also maybe answer a question. David, go ahead and unmute yourself if you're talking. Yeah, you no, that's okay. It was actually uh, uh, push the button incorrectly. So. <laughs> um, well, just if it makes you feel any better, I also push the button incorrectly. Um, so we're all in this together. And David, I, know, um, I noticed that actually. Um, they, I did it to make you feel better. Um, uh, thanks, thanks to David and Chris and all of our other um, uh, members of our um, executive team for for joining us. Um, this is. Uh, this project is, um, is a significant one, and it's been a long-term um, uh, effort for everyone. So everyone's deeply invested in this and um, uh, appreciates hearing your comments and uh, get, getting, getting you answers to your questions and uh, receiving your feedback. So with that, I think we are going to sign off. And as I said, um, if you've got follow-up questions, uh, there's our email on the screen. You can also send us questions and comments in the survey. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us, and uh, we'll, we'll talk to everyone soon.